But, uh, having in mind that CES is uh, happening as we speak, maybe we or, should... Or has happened. Has happened already. Yes. Really don't care. I'm not into priority IT journalism anymore. I don't have to be there. I've been there a number of times, just like you did. So but I, can, I, don't I, think, I don't think that even uh, priority journalism even exists anymore. Uh, let me just start from the... How actually influential is CES now? Well, CES is right now just another show that happens. Uh, a lot of things are happening. Uh, we see new products being um, introduced almost all the time. Mm -hmm. So basically having one large show, having two large shows or having a European and American show or whatever, I think it's a thing of the past because there is so many things to be uh, introduced to the market that the people are not waiting for any particular show anymore. Yeah, it used to be completely different. Yes. Uh, I remember the good old days of CBIT, Computex and CES, though those were the holy trinity of IT shows for us. We used to travel a lot for that and it was not only fun and useful, it was actually um, at the same time a little bit educational while providing some public service as well. But which... the, the other thing is that you could actually got, uh, get in touch with the actual uh, producers and the actual engineers who did the products. So you had much more, not only had hands-on experience with the products, but also had, you had uh, access to the people who actually designed those. No, you still do. It's just that it's different because the proliferation of internet and and the reddits of the world and twitters of the world and everything else kind of diluted that to a situation in which most people have access to almost everybody because everybody is afraid of some kind of a PR storm happening. Yes, but my, my, my biggest problem that I have is that people uh, tend to think that uh, they have the access, but in order to have enough access, you basically still need to prove that you are somebody who is go not going to waste their time. Mm. So uh, if I want to talk to a high-ranking uh, engineer from, I don't know, Intel, AMD, whatever, I still don't have the access in the way that I used to, mm -hmm. because they were usually on one of those big, uh, uh, big uh, different big uh, shows. Uh, you could get the direct access, you could, okay, you needed to um, roll in, in advance, you, you needed to schedule the uh, meeting with them and so on, mm -hmm. but you could get much, much uh, finer and much better information out of them because sometimes the context is what it what matters hmm. we're going to we're going to talk about a lot of uh, things that were introduced in says we weren't there but the context is some, sometimes the something that is uh, interesting and what i'm missing is talking to people understanding the context hmm. uh, i can see the basically whatever what we, we are going to talk about the phone the um, tv the whatever it's going to be better it's going to be bigger it's going to be faster it's going to have a high resolution or whatever mm. but uh with some technologies i want to know what is behind them mm. so for example the thing that i would ask at uh, any uh consumer show right now is what happened to the 3d tv Mm -hmm. What happened to the technology that we had there? Uh, what happened to the... Why is everybody sticking with the uh, 4K resolution? And what is uh, going to uh, drive the rest of the market to support this uh, resolution? Mm -hmm. Because right now, uh, we have seen an enormous amount of uh, 4K uh, televisions, the 4K monitors. We have even seen the 6K monitors, 8K monitors, and so mm -hmm. on. But the content isn't there. What are they going to do to support this kind of technology? And this is something that you cannot see if you're just seeing the end product. Okay. So do, do you want to start or should I? Well, you, you do because I see what you have on the screen. So yeah, I was, I, don't care. I actually spent a couple of hours today checking through various types of various news from manufacturers about stuff that they introduced in CES. And there were quite a few, uh, let's say, PR releases about laptops. You can talk about that a little bit later as well. I saw a lot of releases about uh, TVs and one caught my eye because at the same time, it's funny, semi-useful and really completely unnecessary. Reason, uh, uh, I'm talking about one of the LG TVs that they are presenting on, on CES. That's, you know, OLED, that, uh, it's enormous, the big 97-inch 4K, this, that. But the thing is that the TV is entirely wireless if you, of course, exclude the power. For me, uh, if you have the money to buy a 97-inch 97, 97 OLED TV, 
that's capable of whatever K resolution. You also have money to uh, pay for somebody to do a drywall for you and you can uh, hide the cables behind it. So I don't see the real point of this unless there, uh, there's going to uh, be some kind of an industry shift towards everything being wireless on, on future TVs, which has partially started happening many years ago, but uh, it's nowhere near to be uh, finished or useful for that matter. Yes, but I have a counterpoint. Uh, for the last, I know that for the last eight or nine years, there exists at least one TV that was based on having a breakout box uh, connected uh, with a single cable to the display. I know. And the box was hidden somewhere under the display. So you basically already had the wireless uh, version of the uh, the wired version of the wireless uh, solution for the LG because you had the single cable. This cable was uh, both the power and all the uh, signals and everything else. There used to be a VGA card actually with three or four wireless outputs as well. Yes, I remember so, that. Too, yes, so so years uh, ago. This is not something that I would expect to be a new thing. Uh, I saw that you used the word gimmick, but. It is a gimmick. It's something. It's it, it's it. It is something that is trying to um, show us the new ideas. But uh, forgive me for saying that uh, new ideas are right now uh, how to create a better screen, uh, and this is what actually is in, impressing to for me. Uh, creating a wireless a wireless TV, creating a TV without an edge. I don't care anymore because I'm not going to do a digital signage uh, project uh, on my wall. I need a single TV. So bigger is usually better when it comes to TVs, but I want affordable. I want good color reproduction and I want to be able to actually see what I'm, uh, what I'm looking at. But right now, what I would like to see is much more processing of the images because to be honest, the last generation that I saw when it comes to reproducing the basically what is uh, what amounts to standard definition uh, signal coming out of the set of boxes of the normal operators here at least here in Croatia uh, everything tends to look completely uh, like Max Headroom basically uh, mm -hmm. it looks it looks 80s uh, darker something uh, there's the problem is that the artifacts are being um, phased out by uh, a digital post-production inside the TV and people look like a single skin tone um, cartoon characters because the signal and the information is not there and then the TV tries to uh, reimagine this information and try to recreate the information that is actually not there. So they are trying to uh, do something that shouldn't be done. Mm -hmm. So I would pretty much like for them to stop doing it, to show the image to be closer to what is actually shown. So what was actually shot. And the other thing is that what I would like to see is um, cheaper TVs mm -hmm. because people want to see bigger TVs for a lower price. Nobody cares about uh, four or five or six or $10,000 TV or 10,000 mm -hmm. euro TV. So as I said, with the, as I said, with the graphic cards, uh, uh, in some of the, pre one of the, one of the previous episodes, Everything that is introduced in 100 uh, inch TV, 200 inch TV, whatever, is basically there just to drive the just to drive to the um, uh, demand of the market for the lower priced uh, units. Yeah, it's a PR. Yeah, so exercise. It, it, it's a paid PR exercise. So you probably are not going to see this on any uh, wall soon. Okay. But I want to see more 70 uh, inch TVs uh, that are going to be affordable for me uh, because. To be honest, and let's let's be honest here, how much TV do you actually watch? You want a good YouTube, you want a good Netflix, you want a good um, whatever streaming uh, service you use, you want a good app to use the, the streaming service. You don't care about TV anymore. Mm -hmm. So I care about the display. I mm -hmm. don't care about the gimmicks inside the display. Agreed. So wireless is completely fine with me because I'm not using almost any uh, HDMI ports on my TV uh, right now. I'm using one HDMI port for my uh, console and I'm using another one for the, I think it was, it, 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 it's, it's Chrome, uh, Google Chromecast and that's it. So I have something that resembles pretty much uh, this wireless TV. Mm -hmm. My internet connection is wireless. Okay, that's cool. Okay. Go ahead. So, Your next. 
Okay, so what I chose is to uh, talk about a little bit of what Lenovo did on the CES, because as you can probably see, I'm one of those guys who likes uh, ThinkPads. It's not the ThinkPads are the laptops that I would normally uh, say that I adore, but they have proven themselves to be uh, able to withstand whatever I throw at them. So. I'm not no, 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 whatever you throw them at. <laughs> yes, <laughs> the, 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 that too. And the uh, as I'm probably, uh, as you are, uh, we are uh, sometimes uh, Linux users on the desktop. This is the year of the Linux desktop. We, we all agree that on, the, on this, but the... the chuckle, chuckle. Yes, but when I try to install uh, Linux on any, every laptop, I'm pretty sure that it's going to work on ThinkPad. So this is the reason why I like Think, ThinkPad. And they had two different things that uh, they introduced that I liked because we are not going to do the CES uh, show today. We are just going to see or, or to note what we liked. The one thing that I actually just wanted to mention is that they introduced their own phone that was done by Motorola, uh, the Think Phone. Uh, and basically the idea is pretty much in the branding. So <laughs> basically they created a generic, uh, generic phone that looks like a ThinkPad. Uh, it has a unified clipboard feature, so you can actually talk to the. Uh, you have the interface to talk to the laptops, and you have, you can connect your ThinkPads and uh, your phones, and then you can drag and drop files, and this is nice, and so on and so on. But basically, it's about the branding. So the iconic branding with the red dot and the ThinkPad uh, logo. Is the there? only thing I like about that uh, that particular mobile phone, which stands out a little bit, is the battery that is also uh, charged by 68 or something like that watt a fast charger. That's the only thing that I really like about that phone. That's it. Yes, but this is this is just another. Basically, it's just another Snapdragon uh, phone. Just another phone. Yes, let's let's call them just a Snapdragon phone. Okay, we call that Jaffo from now on. Yes, okay. Just another phone. Just another phone. The other thing is that uh, Lenovo introduced something called Yoga 9i. Mm -hmm. And this is something that actually caught my eye because it is a, it is a convertible, double screen, uh, foldable laptop, yoga book, whatever you call it. Uh, basically, look it up on the internet. But uh, what I like about the device is that it has uh, twin screens. It has a detachable uh, keyboard. Mm -hmm. You can use it as a, a tablet with the stylus. Uh, you can use the double screen uh, device. And basically it looks like uh, it is going to be the device that people actually want to see because it doesn't have the gimmick of having the one continuous screen, but mm -hmm. the two screens side by side, which is probably going to make it much cheaper than the single screen devices because the complexity of the foldable screen is not there. And this means that we are finally going to get uh, screen real estate on a laptop, real estate, basically. Uh, basically, screen real estate on the laptop that is going to work and it's going to be usable from the end user perspective because you can use it as, as a normal laptop. So if you're on the, on a flight, if you need to uh, work somewhere when you have close quarters and you cannot, you cannot uh, open the double, double screen laptop, you can use it that way. Or you can open it uh, side by side or uh, one, one screen. Uh, one yeah, screen. you can do it side by side, or you can do one on top of the other. Yes, and then you can actually you can actually use this device as a double screen the device uh, to do some actual work. This combined with the probably uh, decent amount of battery time, because this is going to be uh, this is going to be probably decent amount of the battery time. I don't I didn't see the uh, particulars about the battery time or the battery life. I mean, yeah, they're not available yet because nobody tested it, so we don't know. We're going yes, to know but, in the future. But this is going to be something that's going to be uh, going to be probably interesting. Uh, so you're coming to slowly but surely to my standpoint of laptops needing to have multiple screens. I was always in the, on the uh, on, on, on the multiple screen uh, desktop uh, front. No, no, because no, laptop desktop is different. Uh, when I talk about desktop, I talk about uh, the way I do things. So my desktop is my desktop. This, Whichever the computer in physical yes. state it is. Yes. Yeah. So okay. I want I want at least two screens. Um, and the other thing is that I want what I really think this device is lacking is moving away from Intel. Because okay. I think that this would be pretty much better if it were powered by something that can de uh, provide you with additional uh, runtime. Because you mean something like Android 
mm, some, some arm, some like arm, some arm, okay. whatever arm, arm it is, because this is going to be mostly a work device. Mm -hmm. This is not a content, um, a content uh, user device. So this is not more like content production than user. Yeah. It's so so it's 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 not something that you would probably use to uh, uh, to uh, consume content. You would probably use this device to create content. Great. So I would like to see uh, an ARM device inside this because I think that the battery strain is going to be enormous because of the double screen. Mm -hmm. So in order to to make this efficient. smaller yeah. and efficient, it would probably need to have an ARM. In line with this, uh, if you you wanted to add something to this or are you done? No, 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 I'm done, I'm done. Then uh, I wanted to add something to this story, which we kind of touched on uh, in one of the previous podcasts, but I want to extend that topic. Uh, for reasons that I think a lot of people will understand. Basically, I agree with you with everything you said. So I also like my laptops being used as both laptops, all foldables or as desktops. Having the capability to run multiple displays for me on a laptop is completely normal. I tend to use more than two, as you know. And laptops in the past, let's say, two to four, three, three four years, uh, have become a little bit more of a, a single screen uh, or two screen devices for the most vast majority of the of the laptops than multi screen devices. Yes, you can go around that problem by adding additional you know USB C um, connectors and then going with let's say USB C to HDMI or something like that. But that's not the point yes. because that abuses your USB ports that you need for something else as well. That's why in one of the previous podcasts I was talking about my approach to using a MacBook with external Thunderbolt uh, eGPU because I needed more ports. And hence the reason why I want to mention the, the next product that was introduced on, on CES, which was a USB 4 dock that seems to me like um, like a dev uh, it seems uh, like a device that finally people might a want to buy and b might want to use. Reason being that it doesn't cost like uh, OWC or Cal Digits uh, Thunderbolt um, docks that are four hundred euros or let's say closer to five hundred dollars plus. That's insanely expensive. This one is closer, let's say, to three hundred, which is a significant drop in price. But it's not the the fact that it's cheaper; it's what it has. It has a quad display connection option. You can hook up four screens, or in higher resolutions, let's say, two screens. But if you wanted to go four times H, uh, four times HD, you can actually hook it up to to that uh, specific uh, Thunderbolt dock via basically a single cable. Okay. I, I find that to be highly useful, especially for content creators, multimedia people. It's going to probably be useful for a lot of people who are doing business if they have a lot of Excel charts or graphs or whatnot. I know that it's not the best way, but bec because of the fact that industry kind of like, you know, sliced our hand in half in terms of not producing enough HDMI DP ports on laptops or via additional docking stations, the, the, this also applies to docking stations mostly, even Lenovo's. So this is another way around it. But the problem is, and this is something that I'm sure we're going to touch on uh, in the next episodes, uh, AMD, for example, presented some new CPUs and mobile CPUs. They still don't support, I think, USB 4 or Thunderbolt 4 on their laptops in 2023. This, okay, is, this is a big problem from the laptop standpoint. But let's let just uh, go and try to be uh, more abstract about this. Uh, what I like is to have multiple uh, uh, multiple monitors when I'm using my laptop because I need screen estate. Yes. But what I don't like is uh, creating a docking solution to give me more screen estate. Agreed. Because, because I want to have my screens with me. Mm -hmm. I am... Okay, I think this dock is amazing. But uh, I'm usually, or right now, my workflow uh, is not supporting... Uh, using my laptop as the primary device that I'm working working which at. pisses you off uh, yes and what I want to is to have a device that is at least uh, on par with the device that I'm using actually using uh, at home it has uh, double or triple uh, 32 inch uh, screens on, on it and it's an actual desktop PC so I understand 
who this is for. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that you can use the laptop at home, you can use your laptop at work, you can just plug it in your, basically what is a dock. Mm -hmm. But I don't, my personal perspective is that I don't like this workflow and I'm not using this workflow. You know, I don't like it as well. I'm just using it as a stopgap solution towards something that I actually need without always having to carry okay. a desktop. Okay. With this, so this for me, that's fine. just a roundabout solution to a common problem that a lot of people have. We are not the only ones. So let me let me just switch quickly to another thing that was fascinating to me uh, that that was uh, introduced at uh, CES. And the other thing that I wanted to talk about is that I think that sometimes uh, companies are trolling us. Uh, MSI introduced a pencil, and oh yeah, yes. Yeah, so the MSI introduced a pencil that is that can is able to write on the screen, and it's able to write on the paper. Hmm. But I'm, I'm I'm completely just give give me a second. It's, How it, it's an amazing it's an amazing uh, concept. So basically, what they did is they created a pen that has the nibs, so the uh, pointy bit of the pen that can be exchanged. This is a normal thing. And the nib is actually made out of graphite. So you can actually use it as a normal pen. Oh, so welcome we back 1980s. So, yes, we have actually, uh, we did a 360 and come back to the actual lead pencil. B pencil. From, uh, yeah. Lead pencil, uh, graphite lead pencil with the uh, uh, graphite la uh, lead inside the pencil from 100 years ago. But right now, the only thing that is new is that this graphite is pure, so it doesn't scratch the screen. Okay, I have a So it doesn't, it doesn't have clay in it. It's just basically just graphite. I have a question. Yes? Are we going to have sm a smart chalk soon in our classrooms? Probably, By yes. extension. But what I wanted to uh, see is nobody was asking, is this graphite available in 2H, 1H, HB? <laughs> various. Uh, where yeah. where, where is uh, hardness uh, levels? Because... I yeah, usually, and widths as and well. And widths, yes. Because I didn't see this introduced. But uh, it seems... Completely trollable, troll product. It, 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 it seems uh, as a troll to uh, as, as, as a troll uh, PR to introduce a pencil on a consumer show and to say that this pencil actually is able to write to the paper. paper. So because who uses paper anymore? Yes, <laughs> At the end and of the, the day. and they they, they mentioned that uh, we are going to use be using a post-it note, and this is the main usage case you can. This write is for business notes. users, yeah. <laughs> so basically, basically what they're saying is that uh, all the different uh, uh, note-taking apps or all the diff different uh, task-taking apps basically suck, and you still need uh, post-it notes in the 2023. But so that's a multi-layer troll. Yes. I, I have an extension question to yes. this because I saw that Lenovo introduced a laptop that has basically two screens, um, like on one and on the other side. One of them is OLED probably, and the second one is e-ink. Okay. I know that you've been looking into buying yourself uh, some kind of an e-ink solution for a while. We discussed this. How do you feel about that type of solution? Uh, as with all the other solutions that are first on the market, I would like to see this implemented. But I'm pretty skeptical the, uh, on the way that this is going to actually be implemented. So I would like to see an e-print uh, e uh, or uh, e-ink uh, screen. I was pretty much on the e-ink screen side 15 or 20 years ago when the um, uh, One Laptop Per Child pro uh, project was pushing the e-ink as one of the solutions for the children to be able to take notes in the school. I have a super old e-ink as well. It's called Iliad. It's well, exactly like 15 years old. Yeah, yeah so, so but, 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 basically, but basically this is the first laptop that was actually trying to be both a cheap and try to push the e-ink as a note-taking uh, measure yeah. so that you can actually uh, read something and take notes inside the school. And this idea was okay. Yeah. Uh, because people actually like writing and uh, doodling on the, on the paper. So it would be nice for me. But I wholly expect that this uh, first generation of this uh, dual, dual uh, screen uh, laptops is going to be more of a gimmick than the, the actual usable uh, device. It's a, I, I think it's a good idea. It's a good idea, yes. But I'm scared about the execution because this is probably going to be too expensive because this is the first one. Mm -hmm. And 
I don't think that they got the memo that people want to use this. So <laughs> I I expect this to be a huge resolu resolution, uh, normal uh, display, uh, not so huge resolution, e-ink, um, short battery life because of the normal display and so on. So I would like to see what is going to happen next. But yes, good idea. Okay, excellent. Okay, while we uh, while we are on the top uh, topic of trolling, uh, by extension, I wanted to add something. Uh, both Intel and AMD introduced a whole stack of new CPUs. AMD was uh, really loud about their 3D v v cache uh, CPUs that they, that they introduced, I think, two years ago or so, and they made some new models as well. So, uh, I'm looking into the crystal ball of uh, of our future, and I'm go I'm going to say this out loud: they are probably going to be available for what two months okay. one month and then they're going to disappear and it's going to be the same story that we discussed uh, in one of the previous podcasts probably you know, basically probably. like a niche product that exists in uh, uh, quantities of uh, i don't know 500 one. or a thousand you know everybody buys that and uh, yeah it is uh, one, one per continent and that's, that's yeah it. the technical pr exercise and we're done which is okay i like the technology i like the idea architecturally speaking i think that amd is on the correct path there but still i would like uh, us to see a bigger proliferation of the technology that's it and the last thing that I want to just mention from the from the CES is that uh, finally, after being in the lockdown or partial lockdown or in the pandemic for the last what is it uh, three it, years it, three years already, uh, a lot of developers uh, have come up with the idea of a reusable uh, automatic mask that is uh, cleaning your air as you breathe it in. It has in uh, included the headphones and so on and so on. So these are the variables that I saw that uh, a lot of companies uh, introduced. Are you trolling now? No, I'm not. Yeah, I, I know what it is. I saw it. So the masks and a whole lot of different uh, devices meant to be Internet of Things devices or being, being wearables. Mm -hmm. So a huge number of pretty or not so pretty watches, mm -hmm. uh, different things that you can actually uh, use in your home. Mm -hmm. um, I see that uh, there was some coffee trends introduced. So basically they're trying to um, cash in on the coffee drinking mentality of a lot of uh, people in the IT. By the way, while it's on the subject of coffee, I had a very interesting discussion with uh, a friend of mine today about it. Okay. You know those uh, super cool, super duper self uh, warming up uh, coffee cups? Yes. There are, I, today I was just strolling and browsing through Amazon and um, I saw two models from the same company costing right around the eight, uh, the area of, let's say, 250 US dollars a piece. Um, this is this is something that is uh, actually a fab right now because people want to uh, be seen as somebody who is understanding the IT guys and who is selling them the, ne ne the necessary accessories for the coffee habit that they have. But my, my necessary accessory for that is called the coffee cup or a plastic cup or a paper cup or uh, whatever. But we have seen self-warming cups. We have seen self-stirring cups. We have seen covered cups. We have seen uh, cups that open themselves cups that are able to keep in the cold so everything the only thing missing on your list is sony aibo to, to carry that to you we saw that demo years ago as well that yes cool. what i would like to see is the actual uh, there, there was a, there was a cute uh, on um, in berlin on the ifa uh, ifa a couple of years ago there was a cool device done by i think it was philips that was able to actually stack the coffee inside the uh, coffee cup uh, so that you could actually see the layers inside the coffee and you could design the layers using the ipad ipad so we have seen all of those coffee, is, cust co coffee customization options yes but the problem is that all of those things are visual yeah uh what I'm lacking in all of these devices is the idea of having some sensors that are going to be actually provi uh, providing you with a better coffee. So uh, something that is going to uh, let you manage brewing time, some things that are going to let you manage the temperature of the coffee and so on. So that you can actually maybe I, I, would, I would also argue that the next step would be a concentration of the coffee as well, because that's what you're after at the end of the day. You are after the taste and Ex exactly you, want, that. you want the repeatable 
environment in, in which to create exactly this taste. That. And a coffee cup that is able to warm itself up, it's a nice thing. But I a want- gimmick? Yes, but I want to have this coffee cup be able to actually tell me what is the actual temperature inside, what is the temperature of the coffee. You can check that, I mean, via app, but... Yes, but I want to be able to influence this because if you are into coffee, you probably know that you want to eliminate as many variables as possible. Mm -hmm. So all this is fine, but I think that the coffee aficionado uh, people um, are not going to be looking just for the um, upfront face value of the devices. They need something to be actually uh useful to create another set of coffee tastes mm -hmm. but okay enough of coffee i see a video on your screen yeah i just wanted to mention shortly one thing that really surprised me about uh nvidia's uh, showing on ces in a very positive way okay so i'm not going to talk about 4070 ti launch basically a launch of a product that was already launched then it was pulled because of public outcry blah 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 i don't care i'm not about the drama what I did like very much is that NVIDIA really uh, managed to surprise a lot of us who are into IT with the fact that they've been finally able to kind of like um, present a lot of designs for the laptops based on the 4D series cards. This I like. Uh, and I'd like to see them as, as fast as possible as uh, actual uh, products that are, you can buy on the market as well. So they are actually doing a good job in terms of producing mobile chips of the latest generation, pushing them into laptops. And probably very soon we're going to have that as, uh, uh, as something that we can buy in our stores. That I really like. Okay, but uh, just one question for mm -hmm. you. Uh, this is the first time in the last whatever years that Apple has missed introducing a new laptop based on the new, uh, on the Pro series. So they didn't introduce the new Mac MacBook Pro uh, laptops. I would argue that I, I was kind of missing, not, not on the CES show, but generally speaking, they're late. And they're also late with the Mac minis, I think, a bit. They are late in everything that is M2 uh, Max and, and M2 uh, Ultra compatible. But what do you have any info? What's the reason? Uh, I don't have the idea. But the, what I was trying to what I was trying to say is that do you expect that people are going to uh, choose sides right now? Because I don't think that buying a high end Nvidia uh, four thousand whatever uh, mobile card mm -hmm. with the Intel chipset and Intel chips or AMD chip whatever. Uh, is going to be something that's going to be interested for content providers, uh, content creators, because if I wanted to had, uh, have a laptop for content creation right now, I would probably go with Apple, mm -hmm. not because of uh, the speed of the graphic card, but because mass, uh, much of the content that is being produced on the go is usually uh, designed in such a way that you actually, actually can pull it off on uh, Apple. And it's much, much easier to use it, uh, to create it on Apple because it has a much longer battery life. Correct. It is much more autonomous uh, and it is much more suited to creating some sort of, sort of content. So let me know, you are the sound guy. Mm -hmm. Would you buy new NVIDIA uh, mobile powered, whatever uh, uh, desktop or uh, uh, sorry, laptop or mm -hmm. probably see, uh, uh, equally priced Apple that is going to do probably the same uh, actual job, but better. Okay, th that's a very good question. If you're talking about multimedia in general, so audio and video and pictures, so static, movable, whatever, then I think you are on point and that there are real questions to be asked there. Reason being that after, uh, let's say, some of the designs with uh, mobile series of uh, NVIDIA's cards appear, uh, uh, I would like to test them and see how they fare in terms of um, not necessarily video encoding. That's the last step. It's about the video production part. This is where the previous couple of generations of Apple devices really shined and worked very well. And if you had a software ecosystem on them like DaVinci or something that was able to use the underlying hardware. That's something that Apple's did very well. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Um, from that standpoint, uh, I think that the question is completely like bullseye question. I don't know. Uh, uh, I kind of have a feeling that because of the fact that Apple is a bit late, 
and because of the fact that we are still going to wait for these mobile designs with the latest NVIDIA cards to appear in the market, they're probably going to uh, be you know, available on the market right around the same time, plus minus a couple of weeks or maybe a month or so. doesn't really matter how much. Uh, then the question is going to be put both of them on the table and check. If you're talking about specific parts of multimedia, that's a different story. Because if you're talking about audio only, mm, yeah, you can put the shotgun to my head. I'm never going to use PC for that. Okay, because I don't see I don't see the market for for high end gaming la gaming laptops to be such a huge deal. Uh, I understand. And it's I agree. it's it's a good thing. It's nice to have a. Um, uh, but you good... don't you don't have to focus on mobile. Let's say equivalent of forty ninety. You can always have something lower. 40 70 60 but 50 i still don't see i still don't see uh media production being done on a card like this because uh if you are a pc user you're probably used to uh, having a huge display and having a huge uh, desktop mm -hmm. uh, that is already equipped with everything that you need so you're not going to switch over to the to using the laptop and if you are used to using a laptop in the apple ecosystem probably you're going to use the next generation of the laptops Could because they are probably going to be uh, uh, cheaper. Uh, I expect I expect <laughs> the, this uh, generation of Nvidia paired with the, with the decent Intel chipset, it is probably going to be over $2,000, uh, even possibly over $3,000. Uh, but MacBooks are not cheaper at that range as well. Yes, but they are compa comparably, uh, che they're comparable to, the, to this price I think they could even be cheaper in this price range. Maybe in the US, definitely not in in uh, in our part of the world. Okay, but, but yeah. this is this is a completely different yeah, yeah. story. Yeah, I, uh, I wanted to expand on this. This is again very very good uh, train of thought. Uh, generally speaking, if you really looked into the architectural details of M M1 and M2, you will probably notice that if you compare them, uh, M2 is not something like uh, uh, like uh, you know. Uh, 250 million percent speed up it's not it's way less than what a lot of people expected in terms of the speed up but it's a little bit better uh, in terms of efficiency so if that's something that that uh, is suitable to your let's say usage model that's cool so i would kind of like reserve the that decision a little bit but in terms of the pricing we have to be honest here and say that it would probably be uh, the best to compare uh, the uh, the Maxes and the Pros, you know, MacBook Pro with M and yes. one M2 Max, M2 Pro, or something like that when they are, are available on the market, to 4090 because uh, 4090 based mobile uh, systems because I think that's where the price similarity is going to be. Okay. Okay, and the other thing is that uh, I forgot the thing that actually I actually saw, but on the on the news, but I didn't mention. Mm -hmm. uh, the Intel introduced the new end generation um, uh, chips, mm -hmm. so they are trying to push into the low end or a cheaper uh, cheaper notebook mar notebook market mm -hmm. because they want to be able to um, create as much friction in this market as possible mm -hmm. because this is the market that is actually pushing numbers mm -hmm. so pushing units is not something that is done we need to do a uh, us versus them the thing about the apple the thing about the um, different market markets because if you are watching this in the states you need to understand that here in croatia you probably wouldn't be buying an apple uh, product not because you don't like an Apple product, but because the Apple products are much, much more expensive here. European than... Union is generally like yes, that. But, yes, but... Because we, we, I heard that the problem is that we are importing them from the US. This is one thing. And the other thing is that you don't have so many ways of paying for the product. Mm -hmm. So you cannot do a credit um, based pay uh, uh, that is going to be uh, without um, any additional uh, interest any additional in, in, interest done on done on it and basically this creates a gap be between the apple products and the, all the other uh, brands because people cannot afford uh, apple products hence the reason why a lot of people from uh, europe fly over to new york city or somewhere yes. buy apple and come back because the price difference makes up for the trip costs yes and this is something that is actually insane but okay i know i agree 
I'm completely with you on that one. Do you have any anything else? Yeah, just one short okay. uh, uh, snippet of news. So last year, uh, around this time, a lot of stuff was, uh, was said about PCI Express 5 SSDs. Okay. Finally, they've shown some uh, production-ready models on the CES. I cannot stress how much I want this to start uh, start becoming available on the market as soon as completely, humanly possible. Com completely, completely, okay. Uh, because uh, as soon as uh, there is a first one that works properly on the market, I'm buying one, at least one. Yes, because they, from what I saw, they twelve are... to fourteen gigabytes per second, depending on reads and writes. Okay, but let let's uh, settle on ten gigabytes per second. That's more being than enough, being yeah. something that is actually going to be workable and working, and I would like to see this, uh, especially when it comes to random random six and random writes, because I want to see my operating system and everything underneath it uh, be able to handle. Uh, actual multitasking so right now i see that the bot bottleneck in the cpu is the uh the, uh, the disks be because we are turning into uh disk heavy operations uh with multiple cores that are trying to basically uh go through the bottleneck of the disk and we need uh, simultaneous uh, multi uh, simultaneous uh, tasks to be able to be done as quick as possible on disks. You don't think that Google Chrome with its memory management is going to help there? Google Chrome is going to be the first thing that is going to actually be look, looking like uh, it works uh, on the on the on the <laughs> new disk. But yeah. my my problem is that we are slowly slow, uh, solving the problem with the memory. I expect that uh, next generation of the Intel is going to be relying on some sort of uh, different access to the memory. I probably I think that they're going to uh, upgrade their own. Uh, they lost obtain the idea of obtain because they discontinued the obtain. Yeah, specifically one of the ways of using obtain was very close yes. to the idea of a very fast memory. Yeah. So, so I think that they're going to incorporate this into the chips. I think that they're going to go mixture of uh, Apple M. Yes, and yes, yes, AMD yes, yes. Free 3D cache. Yes, they're going to hybridize that in some way. Yes, because they need to. Yeah, that's that's where industry is going, and it's good that it's. And going the there. thing that we need then is the faster disks, because Correct. the PCS five PCI five is going to be with us for the next probably five or six years. It's not; it's going to be way shorter. Uh, PC Express shorter was uh, six version was already uh, spec'd. I think that PC Express six is going to be pushed to the market much faster, and there are a couple of political and technical reasons for that. Okay, but we'll we're see. going to cover we'll, that. We'll see. Cover that we'll in see. the future. Okay. Um, for us. The, the availability of PCI Express uh, 5.0 SSDs means two things. Better workflow with virtual machines, which we do a lot. And from the content creation perspective, yeah, it's going to be way easier to, you know, work with video or audio or whatever it is that you want to do on the side or games. It doesn't really matter. So I, I cannot wait for this to start finally appearing because I'm tired of the promises. They uh, were supposed to already be out uh, a quarter ago. On the side note, I think I see that the problem is going to uh, quickly become uh, the availability of the faster networking uh, equipment. Yes. Because we are right now dealing in the home environment. We are dealing with uh, 1G, 1G um, uh, networking. Mm -hmm. We are trying to pretend that uh, that uh, 2.5G and 5G exists, but I didn't see it being used a lot because Correct. the switches are both expensive and basically rare they're not rare. That, they are, they're not all that popular uh, so we need to speed up our networking because i see that a lot of people are uh, getting the fiber uh, to the home mm -hmm. a lot of people are switching to the 1g fiber i even saw that there was a um, there is a provider here in zagreb that is able to provide you with the 2g fiber mm -hmm. so uh, we are going to see that the networking and it's going to be strange, the operators are going to be able to provide you with a much, much faster networking that you will be able to provide in your own home. So I cannot wait for uh, for that to happen, actually. That's going to be first time ever. It. I think that right now is the one of those times because a lot of people don't understand that they still have uh, 100 megabit uh, networking at home mm -hmm. and they are uh, connecting to the uh, to a fiber channel. Mm. So, to a fiber mm. channel. Sorry, fiber. <laughs> That's all good. Okay, I think we've done plenty of news and we can uh, perhaps agree to start with our main topic.
Okay, so uh, let's switch over to the thing that we actually talked about, uh, the AI. Uh, ChatGPT and uh, OpenAI have uh, stirred a lot of things on the market right now. Mm -hmm. I have seen an amazing uh, activity uh, in different parts of the IT. So I even saw that uh, ScriptKid is uh, right now using this um, tool to write the um, uh, proof of concept or even to write malware. Mm -hmm. So it is able to do a lot of things. Uh, but what actually I wanted to talk about is that um, there are rumors, which probably aren't rumors because Microsoft has already been investing in the open AI, that Microsoft is going to use the open AI in the Bing. Actually, this, does this mean that we are actually going to see competition on the search engine, search market. engine market? I have a, I have another question that we could add to the stack. What happens if they uh, finally integrate something that actually works uh, as a search uh, engine in Windows? And no, I'm not being sarcastic right now because Windows Search as Windows Search in Windows has been mostly broken for years. I must and say, I, I, must I have say... another addition, especially if they make it uh, uh, contextually aware and if they make it uh, inter just like SharePoint so that it goes through the content and gathers all the information, you know, stuff so that you can search. How would you so like the that? Dreaded, the dreaded indexing service in the Windows. Yes. Yes. Content uh, indexing. Yes. So content indexing in the Windows is something that I first uh, disable whenever I install my Windows. Yeah, I started di disabling that when I bought my first SSD in yes. 2008. Yes. So, so this is one thing that we do. And uh, to see something that is able to actually effortlessly index uh, things that I have in my uh, PC is, um, it would be amazing. Uh, from the Windows perspective, I would settle with having a search that is actually able to find the apps and the uh, documents by name. By name, yeah. Uh, yes. If it only worked reliably. Yes, because uh, Microsoft has been steadily uh, breaking and fixing the uh, search for the last probably five or six years. Uh, I noticed it first uh, on Windows Server. Yes, but the, the, they are steadily trying to, uh, they're probably trying to do stuff on the searching uh, engine. And they are trying to create a searching um, uh, algorithm that actually works. Mm -hmm. So what they try to, uh, what they're trying to uh, do, obviously, is to mess with the code that is behind the search. Mm -hmm. Uh, having all that code thrown out mm -hmm. in favor of something like a uh, chat GPT mm -hmm. would be amazing. Agreed. And because, uh, however, people uh, try to pretend like it's, it's not there. Uh, there is a uh, small utility called search everything. Mm -hmm. It's a freeware. I can just mention it because they are probably, if they want to sponsor us, I don't think they have any money to sponsor us. <laughs> so, so I don't care. Not the topic. Uh, but this is the freeware that I'm using. And this is the first thing that I install on every Windows that I use. Because Search Everything is able to use the NTFS uh, features to be able to find all the files with uh, with a certain name or a certain regex on your disks. Uh, a quick, easy to use, uh, basic search is something that is actually missing on the Windows. Agreed. And uh, Microsoft should stop uh, trying to pretend that they're going to create the next generation uh, of the search because uh, it is uh, almost the same as the mem uh, with uh, next time this year, uh, next time this, uh, this year, uh, next year we will be millionaires. Because Microsoft is trying to pretend like next uh, next year, this time we are going to be able to do the searching on the local, uh, local computer. Mm. It's been going on for the last 30 years. We had, we even had, uh, partially successful Google search bar on the windows that was actually working better than the windows integrated. One. Agreed. So, uh, I would like to see local search, but let's for a second, pretend that we don't care about the uh, desktop. Just wanted to mention, because that's an obvious thing that where they could integrate some, an engine like that. Yes. But first thing they should do is fix the abysmally, uh, uh bad, bad I, I wouldn't say abysmally bad, but I would say abysmally uh, uh, designed Bing search engine uh, like it is now, because Bing is trying to be uh, innovative, but at the same time, it's trying to be competitive with uh, Google search without having the right algorithm.
So it is not competitive enough in the way that it returns, uh, it, uh, it is able to search the results for mm -hmm. the results. And then it's trying to uh, present those results in an innovative way. It is okay. But the main point of searching is able to be being able to find a particular information that I'm looking for. Agreed. So if I had something like ChatGPT, uh, just because of the context of uh, awareness of the ChatGPT provides you, uh, just to go through the, all the different pages that uh, uh, Bing or whatever search engine has, uh, this would be a great thing for me. Because usually when I'm trying to uh, find something, and probably all of you do, do this, uh, I'm trying to find uh, bigger, the idea of what, uh, ballpark uh, idea of what I'm trying to search for, and then I'm trying to uh, narrow, it down. Uh, narrow it down to a search that I actually uh, need to find something. If I would be able to explain to the uh, search what I need, uh, it would probably be something like the Blade Runner thing about uh, enhance uh, this sector, enhance and so on. So this is the idea of the search that I want. I want to be able to say, okay, I'm looking for an image of a boy on a bicycle running, running with a dog and then saying, okay, out of all these images, please get me only, only the black dogs. And then being able to narrow it down contextually without having to rewrite the entire search string. So hmm. this would be amazing. I think that you are actually kind of like scratching on the on the surface of a topic that's a bigger one than this one, but it's completely related. And it's actually partially related to the the topic that we covered in our first podcast as well about GPT, which is AI in general. Yes. Are you trying to tell me that uh, you you found the first implementation of ChatGPT that you really really support and like? Uh, yes, because uh, right now I think that both Microsoft and Google are going to become competitive again because this is a game changer for Google. Mm -hmm. Because Google was using they had uh, they bought the uh, Nora. Neuro, whatever, uh, Neuro Lab, Neuro Link, whatever, uh, the um, uh, AI uh, startup a long time ago, they didn't do anything about it. And right now I see that ChatGPT is something that people are actually uh, very interested in. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the preview for the ChatGPT uh, went over 1 million users in a couple of days, a couple of days ago, and they are running on the Microsoft infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Basically, mostly because the Microsoft is uh, was investing a billion dollars into the, into the uh, uh, open AI, and most of it was actually infrastructure costs. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing that I would like to see is AI moving the market because this search market is becoming stale. No, uh, no, no. What you're saying, you want AI to move the market towards competition. Yes, because what I want to be able to ask this, uh, ask the, for, for example, a search engine, what are the pages you're not indexing? indexing? Mm -hmm. Because I want to see how big the uh, this gray area of the internet is. I want to be able to say, okay, uh, for a second, ignore uh, most used searches, please give me the least used uh, pages. So I want to search for, I don't know, a particular completely um, irrelevant piece of music. If I search on a particular uh, search string, I'm going to see whatever other people saw. I want to be able to ask the search engine to be as irrelevant as possible. And this is not something I'm able to do, uh, you, you do today. Because so, the search engine is generalized yes. based on numbers. Basically. So, so I want to be able to tweak the algorithm and Chat, chat of, of the open AI uh, already shown us that you are able to do exactly the, that thing to the uh, algorithm to say, okay, I want you to behave in this way. I don't want you to behave as you would normally for a normal user. So being able to influence the algorithm of the search engine mm -hmm. to say, please be dumber than you are, mm -hmm. or please give me the least wanted pages is something that would make searching easier easier yes okay why because right now all the filters are based on top whatever i want to be able to uh, base, base my filters on whatever i don't want the top 
I want to be able to say, okay, right now, completely disregard the... the Top the, 10? No, no, no. The, the completely disregard the uh, popularity of the pages. Give me the longest page available uh, covering the topic of, I don't know, what fr a fruit fly. Mm -hmm. And then I would expect to see the page with the most information or the uh, most, uh, the page that is able to provide me with the most information in one place. I have a question. Yes. And you might not like it and you can tell me freely to go to hell yes. if you don't want to answer it. What you're talking about is basically political. Yes. It always is. Do you, uh, is your, uh, basically your uh, two minute rant that you just went to, uh, I happen to agree with it, by the way, just so you okay. know. Uh, is that based on the idea that you don't want to be treated as a top end research uh, uh, puppy? for the search engines and you want everything to be customized to your needs. Is that that? Which means basically that uh, the idea of Google search as it is now at this second in time needs to be um, in your view, uh, partially disassembled. Yes, completely. But the idea is not this. Uh, the idea is that uh, Google search is the best search engine that we have right now. Mm -hmm. But did this by no means means that this is the best search engine. Yeah, but like absolute. Yes, okay. because this search engine is unable to provide you with the results that are uh, tailored to your actual tastes. Uh, it is able to provide you with the these but results. It, it is, but it's very gimmicky about it. You need to, you need to do a lot of additional filtering for it. Yes, but the other the other uh, other thing is that. Basically, as soon as you go out of the box a little bit, mm -hmm. you are unable to do anything. Uh, it's much, much, much harder, harder to do the filtering and do the different keyword searches and so on, because uh, all the search engines are designed for the, I would say, normal or average or whatever. No, no, they're user. designed for boxes. Yes. So if you are outside the box and you need some information that is outside of the box, you are probably going to have a hell of a ride to try to find this information on the internet. Because even when I know there is something that I'm looking for, I'm probably not going to be able to find it on the, on the Google or on the Bing or whatever. And I'm going to just say one thing. I'm using at least four computers in my life. Uh, sometimes I even have problems with Google being able to find something in my history, what I actually uh, was browsing two Agreed. days ago or three days ago. Yeah, I know. And this is the probably one of the stupidest thing that I can actually, actually uh, think of because if the search engine is unable to return me the same result that I saw yesterday and it is unable to see this result and this is especially the case when I'm uh, browsing through the YouTube on my phone and then on my laptop and then on my desktop, then on my t TV. Uh, then what's the use, use case for so, a search engine? Yes. And the other thing is that YouTube is an amazing uh, service, mm -hmm. but YouTube is also unable to keep track of where am, am I uh, in different parts of different uh, clips when I switch a uh, device that I use. Yeah, it's not working perfectly. I agree. It's working but it takes a lot of time because of the sharding and everything else uh, uh, having to do with uh, cloud computing and whatever. Yeah. But the end user doesn't care. The end user wants the effortless um, moving away from one device to the other device. I want to be able, if I'm, let's say, browsing some, something on my um, uh, mobile phone, when I see something that I want to see on the big screen, I, want to be, I just want to be able to flip on the big screen and to see it. But also, this is a gimmick that they're able to do. But also, I want to be able to say, okay, I saw this 10 minutes ago on my mobile phone. I need it on my uh, TV now. And You want automation. Yes. And this automation is uh, regrettably completely uh, out of the league of what, what is uh, going on now, right now. So I want to see Google being forced to actually work on the search and uh, being able to, uh, 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 being forced to work on the, usability or their, their uh, um, different services because Google is becoming lazy. They are becoming a behemoth that is lazy. So that's not, there's a, a really good term for that. It's called complacent. Yes, yes, complacent is a problem, but they're, they're uh, right now a mature company with an enormous amount of engineers 
that has become uh, self-involved and completely self-sufficient. And because there is no uh, competition on the search market, because the uh, share that uh, I think that the Bing share is some, something around 5% of the search market. Yeah, something abysmal. So uh, when a company like Microsoft is able to uh, prov uh, to only get 5% of the market share after spending what whatever amount of billions of dollars. And uh, for the years. And, and uh, okay, let's say five or six years, but. Uh, no, 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 generally speaking. Yes. So we need some way to uh, wake the market up. So I want to see the competition. I want to see uh, Google being forced to do something. Okay, I have another question. Do you see uh, yourself using this, uh, let's say, let's say that they integrate Bing with G uh, ChatGPT, which I, I also find to be a very good uh, fit. What you were describing right now is using it as a search engine, which I'm completely on, on, on board with as well. What I would per perhaps like to see is voice integration because that's the logical next step. I don't want to type what I'm searching for. I want to say, you know, okay, Alexa type of thing or okay, Siri. Uh, I want to say that to, to Bing. Uh, it doesn't have to be called Bing and the uh, assistant, whatever they build, I don't care, Cortana or something else. Doesn't really matter what it is. I want to be able to basically interface with that via voice, not only via, uh, via uh, typing. Yes, but this creates another problem. Mm -hmm. uh, this is going to be a user interface problem mm -hmm. because uh, nobody actually designed a user interface that is uh, a discussion or conversation like. Exactly my they point, tried, which they, they should. To, yes, they try to, but uh, they are trying to basically make this uh, convincing, but they are trying to create whatever, what, what basically is Eliza. So they are trying to uh, mask the uh, in, uh, lack of capabilities of the system to be actually able to understand you. Mm -hmm. Chat GPT is getting close to understanding what you're trying to uh, say to it. So there is going to be a big problem how to integrate the voice part of the because i'm i'm, I'm completely on your side uh voice search is something that i want to see yeah but the problem that i see right now is that uh we need not only the voice part of the user interface so me being able to talk to the pc I also need to be able to explain to the PC how to describe and how to show the information to me on the screen. Right now, we are in most involved in the strict templates done by Google or Bing or whatever. Boxes yet again. Box yet again. Google had an amazing thing uh, going on when they created the, uh, you, you were able to create your own uh, search page mm -hmm. with different parts of the page gadgets and so on. But this was discontinued. The main reason that I think that they discontinued the page was the problem that they probably had with scaling. Because if you have a billion users and when mm -hmm. you're trying to create uh, 10, gadget, 10 uh, different gadgets or whatever they are called on the page, and you basically are dealing with 10 billion objects that you need to be able to refresh and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. But um, this is one of the things that I would, be able, uh, I would like to see. Yeah, because I, I I want to be able to take my search page with me. I want to be able to explain to the PC or to, to my laptop. Right now, I'm trying to do something on whatever, Raspberry Pi. I want to group my icons on the... I want to see the Raspberry Pi uh, pinout on the left. I want to be able to see the whatever schematics is on the right. I want to be able to see the... Uh, in the middle, I want to be able to see this particular PDF and so on and so on. So I want to be able to, to create my own um, uh, search page or presentation page. It would it's be more like information presentation. Yes, yes. Presentation. And I want to be able to pilot it by using the voice. Agreed. Because if I want to see something like, and this is, unable, I'm able to do this uh, even by using any, any assistant uh, right now. If I want to see, for example, I need a Raspberry Pi pinout. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to talk. I want to be able to talk to my PC and say, "Okay, on the screen one, please show me the pinout for the Raspberry Pi." Mm -hmm. Because right now, contextually, uh, devices are unable to understand which part of the screen, which which screen is which. They are unable to understand what am I trying to t talk to. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Am I talking to my mobile phone? Am I talking to my uh, laptop, my TV or whatever? So I want to the, the devices to be actually integrated. Oh, but there's another problem there. Yes. So you're completely on the correct path, I think, as well. But I see a fundamental security slash privacy issue there. Yes. Because this is going to be this is going to be abysmally problematic. Yeah. Uh, reason being that uh, if we are about to go with our voices into searches, and then we want to have you know, our phones, our tablets, our tel uh, our uh, laptops, whatnot, doing searches for us in a contextual se uh, way in which you mentioned, it's going to have to be some kind of a anonymized or local implementation of some sort of AI engine that's able to understand you because you do not want uh, the, the data of your voice and your searches and whatnot, specifically because your voice is basically uh, a type of personal data as well. Yes. You do not want that to be sent to the cloud in any sense or fashion. What you would want perhaps is that voice to be trans, uh, basically translated into text and then perhaps sent. That would be kind of like a stopgap solution, but long-term solution, it, it is not. Unfortunately, all the devices that they're using the different assistants are either yeah. sending all the voice prompts or sending some voice prompts to the cloud to exactly be able to, my problem uh, yes and this is something that's already happening yeah. if you have a google assistant uh, on you can actually listen to your own uh, google uh, uh, different voices that you have used uh, and different uh, voice samples from your uh, searches you can find them on, in your Google account. Mm -hmm. So you can actually play them back. You can delete them from there, which is an okay thing, but you can actually find all the different things that you uh, said in the last couple of years. So this is something that is going to be a big privacy problem. But as with everything else in the IT, uh, we are going to be become a privacy nightmare because right now we don't have that many sensors on us and in the environment. Uh, I can see uh, the future where you can actually go to, uh, when you're going to go to, uh, to your office mm -hmm. and your boss is going to be uh, asking the surveillance system, when did weather come uh, to the office? Mm -hmm. And the system is going to be able to understand who is veteran, mm. what is the veteran's office, which camera to look at, uh, how, to how you look, Mm -hmm. where to find you and then say, okay, he came to the office 10 minutes late. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be something that you are going to be uh, exposed to every day. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be a nightmare. But uh, let's imagine that we are right now uh, living in the ideal world and we are right now trying to deal with the, how the search is going to uh, look. Because this search is all uh, obviously going to involve not only the internet, but also the a lot of your personal data. Because I want my personal data to be able to uh, be searched. I want to be able to say, okay. Yeah, but but locally. Yeah, whatever. But in some sort of secure way. Yes, because the the uh, as a user, I want to be able to say, let's say, create a photo uh, album of my kid uh, when he was three years old, mm -hmm. and this is more or less what Google is able to do, do, do right now, but in a clumsy way. You need to create, uh, he, it, is, it is able to understand, uh, understand which face is my kid. Uh, Google is able to understand what is the time, uh, zone, time limit that I want to uh, concentrate by search on. And then it's able to find the different images that uh, are covering this, this uh, period in time. But this is not, efficient enough right now because I need a lot of tweaking to do this. I want to be able to, say, to see a search like this working. And this is right now completely impossible without the cloud uh, being a backend for all my images and all my photos. And this is a security nightmare. Okay. Do you see this as well as a political issue? Everything is political. When, oh, it, comes really? to, when it comes to money, everything is political. Yeah, that's, that's exactly the concern that a lot of people are going to definitely have. Because with these sorts of services. That's clear as day. So, politics is something that is going to be completely unavoidable. Because... Uh, Yuck. I'm sorry, but we live in, in a completely broken world that is basically ruled by money and politics. So, I'm not going to try to uh, say that we are not going to be influenced by this. Uh, 
it is going to become worse before it becomes, becomes better. Yeah, just like a lot of different health issues of the world. Yes, but the problem is that uh, the right now technology basically exists to monitor, for example, your vital signs. Mm -hmm. uh, it has existed for the last 15 years or so. I have seen prototypes uh, on one of the shows that we're mentioning in the mm -hmm. start of the episode. But the problem that they had back way then and the problem that they have right now is not that they are unable to uh, follow your signs or follow your whatever um, information they have about you. Mm -hmm. They have a problem because they need an enormous amount of clinical trials to be able to understand what the, what does the, does the, this data mean. And right now, the idea of connect, uh, collecting the data from a million people or two million people or three million people, and then getting all this data pushed to the cloud, being processed and then being uh, turned back is something that nobody is going to try to do. So we have the technology. We are right now in the middle of trying to understand what the politics behind the technology is going to be. And the companies are able to do this, but they are afraid mm -hmm. with the reason. And this reason is completely okay with me because I wouldn't want to see uh, my data published on the internet, but at the same time, I would like to see uh, a device that is able to monitor me for, I don't know, signs of uh, heart problems or some signs of uh, like a smartwatch can. Yes. Because my smartwatch is able to actually uh, uh, notice differences in my um, blood pressure. No, 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 not blood pressure, but the rhythm of my heart. So it is able to detect the fibrillations and uh, bigger problems with the heart that um, uh, can become dangerous and possibly deadly. I would like to see this kind of uh, a smart device on me. Helpful technologies. Yes, but the helpful comes with the cost. Mm -hmm. You need some sort of uh, initial data to be able to say what is actually helpful. Because when I was talking about uh, the technology, it was a long, long, long time ago. Uh, I saw a prototype of a small chip that was uh, designed to be uh, actually injected directly into the bloodstream. And it was able to collect, I think it was 15 or 16 uh, different parameters from the blood oxygenation level, uh, different levels of different things uh, inside the blood and so on. And the problem was that uh, people who were behind the technology said that they are able to monitor those signs, but they don't know what the normal number for the sign is. Mm -hmm. uh, bear with me a little, bit, a little bit. When you take your blood tests in the morning, the reason why we are taking the blood test uh, early in the morning is not the re uh, is not because they want to have some sort of control over you. It's because they have a huge range of the values for each particular thing that they can monitor in your blood. And they want to be able to at least say, okay, this is the range that is normal for a person uh, early in the morning after he has been sleeping. Mm -hmm. Everything else is completely uh, up for grabs. So your sugar level, can probably be from whatever. X to Y. Which, X to Y. Yeah. And sometimes I know that they had a problem because they were trying to monitor people. They said that uh, their own um, implementation of the monitoring uh, was uh, describing the state of the particular individual as critical because some sign was completely off the scale. And when they uh, were trying to see, okay, what the person was doing in this particular moment, he was running. Mm hmm or something was actually scared him. So he was scared for five seconds. And this is something that is not normally shown on your blood, the blood tests, but the finer details inside your uh, screening system. Context, yet again. Context, yes, the, the problem is the context. So a lot of things are going to become even more complicated with all the data being collected. And right now we are seeing how the uh, first glimpse of the way this data is going to be parsed is going to look like. Okay. Let's say that we've been at it long enough. So I have a, let's say uh, my final question. Okay. How do you see all of this that you mentioned in the past five, 10 minutes, whatnot being integrated with chat GPT as an engine that's going to tell you, you have this, this or that in terms of health 
in terms of sickness or something like that? Because that's, the, again, the logical next step. I have absolutely no idea. I know that uh, we are just scratching the surface. I know that right now GPT-3 is on the market. GPT-4 is already being announced and they're going to put it in the market in the next couple of months. So, and the next generation should be, uh, they said that it's going to be significantly better than the GPT-3. Okay. And right now GPT-3 is scary. Mm -hmm. So I For have- some of us. Yes, I have, I have no idea. I have no idea how this is going to pan out, but we are going to see what is going to happen. Because the problem is that um, a, a lot of things being changed for the better, a lot of things being changed for the worse, and we are going to see a lot of things just being changed in a different way that we are we cannot even imagine. Mm -hmm. So when I said that I need more screens on my laptop, mm -hmm. this is all fine. If we stick to the, I have a keyboard, I have a screen and multiple screens and so on. But if I'm able to talk to my laptop, I don't need the, 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 those many screens because I'm able to say, okay, contextually, please give me the information about whatever mm. on something um, that is not a screen. On an app. Uh, yes, but let's say I want to say to my laptop, please, uh, if it's going to rain in the next two, uh, two hours, uh, please notify me. Mm -hmm. And then I don't need uh, any of the screen estate to show me this mm -hmm. because I don't care. Mm -hmm. It's going to notify me whenever the information is going to be uh, important to me. So changes in the way the uh, data is being searched and the data is being uh, presented to you is probably going to change the way that you use your devices and it's going to be probably influencing the way the devices are being designed. Mm -hmm. Because basically the keyboard that takes uh, almost all of the space on the laptop is a necessary evil. Mm -hmm. You don't need the lab, uh, keyboard if you're able to talk to the laptop. And mm -hmm. this is something that we can uh, we could get uh, rid of. And then what you're going to, going to end up with? Uh, basically screens. a tablet. A tablet. A tablet. Yeah. Yes. So we are going to get a foldable tablet. Fine. I'm, yep, fine, I'm with fine with that as well. Yes. Okay. Okay. So let's let's close the things uh, close this thing down and say uh, we have seen a lot of things we have done a lot of things and uh, the future is going to be bright. Thank you for finally saying that. Yes, I'm trying to be not, not sarcastic. So uh, <laughs> you well, almost pulled it off. Yes. So I was Yasmin. He was Vedran. Yeah, and that was it for today. Okay. Bye. Bye.